angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation shall be able to separate me from my God. And if my God is for me, who can be against me? I will fight. Good morning to River Church. How are you guys doing? Man, that, that video pumps you up, right? <laughs> it pumps me up every time I see it. Uh, I wanted to say good morning and welcome for everybody who's here for the first time if, or if this is your church home. We're so glad that you're here celebrating Family Sunday with us, Student Takeover Sunday with us. And we're in a series called No Ordinary Family. And what that means is we're trying to live Throughout this series, we're trying to discover how to live an extraordinary life, the life that God has for us with relationships, with our family, with our church family, with our relatives, our moms and dads, our sisters and brothers, and also with, with, um, with our relationship with um, just the people that we see around us. And so in this series, No Ordinary Family, we've been discovering that. But before we get to um, what we're going to talk about today, just want to introduce myself. My name is Alex, and I have um, just a honor and the privilege to pastor the worship arts um, team here. And then also I do have the honor and privilege as well to look after the student ministry. Next Gen, make some noise. And I don't know if you know, you probably know by now, but the student ministry, man, there is a movement happening like no other. There is something that is going on that I can't even explain because God's hand is in this student ministry. And this is just the beginning. And it, these are not just words that I'm just saying just because that's what we say about student ministry because there's students who you want to encourage them. No, this is for real. Like, like in all my years in ministry, I haven't seen a student ministry that has had the zeal and the affection and the love for God that I've seen in such a short time with these students. And it's just an amazing thing for me just to sit and witness what God is doing in them and through them. And it's just an amazing thing to, to just witness. And, um, and I want to congratulate you guys to Rivers Church because you made that happen. You played a part in that. See, last summer... We go to um, a camp every summer called Forward Conference. And so we have a lot of fun. It's crazy, like five days of like no sleep, fun, you know, a life-changing word, great worship, amazing worship by like Hillsong and, and um, Bethel and all these great worship bands. And um, some of these students last year that hadn't even started to be in our student ministry yet wanted to go on this trip. However... Some of them didn't have the means to go. Some of them didn't have the finances to be able to go on this trip. And that's when you guys stepped up. You guys planted the seeds for some of the students to go on this trip and have that life change happen in their life, have relationships that they never had before, and, and, and experience true life change. And that all happened by the seed that you sowed. You guys made that happen. You guys are a church for the next generation, amen? And I just want to commend you guys and just congratulate you guys for doing that because, man, we're a church that believes in all generations. We be, we're, we're a multi-generational church, but for you to have the heart for the next generation, man, this is the future of the church. So we're thinking not just what's happening next year, but what's going to happen in the next five years, in the next ten years here at Two Rivers Church. And so I just want to congratulate you, you know, just, just being able to do that. And um, this is also a church where we say this a lot here at Two Rivers, where friends become family. And what that means is we want this to be a place where you come to church and real relationships happen. You come in here and you get prayed over. You come in here and you feel like, wow, like I was a guest here, but now I found some friends. And then sooner but later, wow, I found some friends, but now I feel like I found family. And that's our heart. And that's why we have opportunities like we do today after the service because we're going to hang out and we created a platform for you guys just to do community together, just to hang out together, just to um, have fun together and to eat together. Who's hungry, y'all? All right. Yeah, some of you are like, all right, hurry up because I'm hungry. <laughs> but, 
But here's the thing, like, um, this is why we have those opportunities, because we want you guys to be our family. And maybe you've been praying about that, wrestling, you know, through that, or in an investigation period of this is, if this is your church home, or maybe this is your first time. But we want to let you know that everyone here is welcome, and we want you guys to be part of our family. And so in the spirit of that, today what I want to talk about is family, of course, because we're in a series called No Ordinary Family, but what I really want to hone in on is fighting for a real family, fighting for a real family. You know, if we're being honest right now, if we're being real, we would say that family is messy. Can we say that? Church, can we be real today? Can we just like have a real, real dialogue here and just say family can be messy, both literal and figuratively speaking, right? I mean, there's times where, um, where I'm at home and sometimes everybody pitches in in my house. We have a big family. It's me and my wife, my beautiful wife, Christy, and four kids, y'all. Four kids. Now you know how to pray for me. <laughs> And with these four kids and my wife and myself, sometimes we get together and we clean the whole house. I don't know if you've ever done that. You just kind of say, we're going to clean the whole house today. It takes hours and we're, we're almost at the brink of like wringing each other's necks. But we get it done and we clean the house. And it's no later than about 2.3 seconds that I go to the fridge and just try to get something to drink. And I look back and it's a mess. <laughs> It's a complete and utter, utter mess. It's just a mess, everyone. And we're like, how did this happen? We just cleaned the whole house. How did this happen in 2.5 seconds in a blink of an eye? There's a mess. And sometimes, if we're being real today, relationally with our family, that happens. Relationally, two or three years ago, man, your students, your relationship with your parents was on point. Your relationship with your parents was great, but then something happened that created a mess. And at first it was something small, but now there's just a mess everywhere. Parents, man, before your kids hit puberty, everything was great, right? <laughs> and everything was wonderful and everything was, was, was just Amazing, and, and, and your relationship with your, with your son or your daughter was on point and things were going right and everything was going great and they just couldn't get enough of you. But now they can't stand you. <laughs> and now a mess has happened and then another mess and another mess and it overwhelms you to the point of saying, how did we get here? How did this happen? Have you ever been there? I know I have. How did this happen? How did this mess happen? And so I started to think about that, and I started to think about what does Jesus want for our lives? Like truly, in the real, what does Jesus want for our life when it comes to relationships and our life in general? And it got me to um, a scripture that I was studying found in John 10.10. 10. If you have your Bibles, you could go ahead and get that out. John 10.10. 10. And it says this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Sometimes we read that verse a lot of times, but I need you to feel it today, church. Because the truth is that you have an enemy that is after your throat. You have an enemy that is here to rob your future, to rob your family, to rob everything that Jesus wants to give you, everything that God wants to give you. He's trying, he's trying to do all of that. He's trying to rob your real life. He's trying to destroy your identity. Students, he's trying to rob your purity. He's trying to, he's trying to rob everything that, that, that God is trying to tell you, and he's trying to attack you. The enemy is a real thing. He is trying to to attack you. He's trying to attack you. Some of you need to hear that because sometimes we hear that and we feel like that's just a verse, but that's real life. See, the enemy has an agenda and his agenda is destruction. He also has a strategy and his strategy is division because he knows if he could divide your family where you're not seeing eye to eye anymore, he has your family. See, he has a tactic and his tactic our offenses. See, when, when he knows that we could be offended by each other, because sometimes the people that hurt us are the people that are closest to us, right? Sometimes it's our mom, students, sometimes it's our dad, sometimes it's our brother or sister, um, sometimes it's our spouse, sometimes it's our husbands and wives. And the enemy has an agenda. 
He has a strategy. He has a tactic. And what do we have? See, the rest of that verse in John 10, 10 says this, and this is Jesus talking. I came, everybody say, I came, that they may have life, that's us, and have it abundantly. That means that Jesus wants you to live a life free of regret, free of bondage, free of your own self-hatred. Don't we want that, church? Like, don't we want that? Don't we want to win at life? I mean, don't we want to win in the things when it comes to relationships with our kids? Don't we want to win when it comes to relationships with our spouses? Don't we want to win at life? And the reality is this. In order to win, in order to get this life that Jesus is saying and talking about, to come so that we may have life and life abundantly. In order to win at this life, in order to obtain this life, we have to understand that there's going to come a time in our life where we're going to have to stand up and fight. That we're going to have to stand up and fight for our family. That we're going to have to stand up and fight for the real thing. That we're going to have to stand up and fight for the right thing. That maybe we've been taking way too much time for the enemy to gain too much territory in our lives and in our families. When Jesus says, I've come to give you life and live abundantly. But we're going to have to do something different in order to experience something different. Amen. Because so many times we kind of think, well, we kind of do the same thing over and over and over and over again. Different results would happen. But that's the definition of insanity, right? <laughs> and so what needs to change? Because Jesus is saying, man, some things need to change. You need to stand up and fight. There's come, there comes a time when Jesus fights for you, of course. But there comes a time when we have to fight. And God will do the rest. And the first thing I want you to know and write down um, if you're taking notes is this. When it comes to fighting for a real family, we have to know that we are fighting for a real life versus a fake life. That we are fighting a real life versus a fake life. See, Jesus wants to give us life and life abundantly. He wants to give us a real life, a life full of integrity, a life full of honesty, a life that's not perfect, but it's real. Every morning you have that decision. Every morning you have a choice to fight, everybody say fight, for a real life or to be handed the fake life that the enemy wants to give you. And there's a path that we have to walk in order to obtain this life. As, as I started reading scripture, Jesus continues to talk about it in Luke chapter 13, verse 24. If you go ahead and look on with me in Luke chapter 13, verse 24, and it says this. It says, strive, fight. Do whatever you have to do to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. And yes, the first step is salvation, so we have a relationship with God. But if Jesus is saying that he wants to give us life here on earth, we have to strive. We have to fight. We have to do what we can do in order to enter a narrow door. Because not many will enter. It says... The way to life is a narrow, narrow door, and, it, and it's a door that opens to freedom. It's a door that opens to purpose. It's a door that opens to joy and abundance with our family. But there's this other door, this broad door, right, that everybody and most people walk in that path. And that door leads to regret with our families and our relationships, that that door leads to destruction. That door leads to a life wishing that you could go back. That door leads to a fake life. And I just started thinking, you know, what, what are some steps that we have to take in order to just live in this real life that Jesus was talking about? And the first step that I believe we have to take in order to live in a real life with our relationships is to live an honest life. To live an honest life. The first step to living a real life is to live an honest life. Look with me in Psalms 139, verse 23 through 24. 
And this is a psalmist talking. And if you don't have a Bible, you can look up on the screens. Verse 23, it says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there are grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And what the psalmist is saying is, search my heart, O God, because if there's something that shouldn't be in there, if there's something that you need to reveal, that I need to change, I, I need to be honest with you, Jesus. I need to be honest right now. And if there's something in my heart right now that doesn't belong, can you reveal it to me? But again, can we be real, church? Sometimes when we pray to God and we pray kind of those prayers, God reveals it to us. But when he reveals it to us, we're like, no, 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 I, 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 I know you reminded me of that five times already, but that's not what I need right now, Jesus. Because what I need right now is a promise. What I need right now is a blessing. But can I tell you something? God can't bless who we pretend to be. And God is saying that we need to be honest with ourselves. And the first step is to be honest with God and say, God, is there something in my heart that doesn't belong? Is there something in my life that you need to bring out? Is there, do I have anger towards somebody that I need to address? As students, am I so angry and, and, and hateful towards my parents that, that that's not the way that you called me? That's, that's a broad life. That's, that's not the narrow life. That's not the life that's full of abundance. Students... Search my heart is what he's saying. Parents, you might be so mad with your kids that you don't even talk to them anymore. And I know that could happen and life happens sometimes. But Jesus is saying, be honest with me. Talk to me in full honesty and say, search my heart, oh God. If there's something that doesn't belong, that, that, that's being a conflict between me and my son or me and my daughter or me and my brother, or me and somebody in this church, let's bring that out and let's move towards reconciliation, right? And, 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 and with church, just talking about church, this is a church of restoration. This is a church where we know that we could realize that this is a place that we could receive healing um, and, and all those things. But we also know that this could be a church where fakeness can be present. Where we wear a mask and tell everybody everything is fine and it's not. Where we come here and everybody says, hey, are you okay? No, yeah, I'm okay. Um, no, are you really okay? Because you look pretty down today. No, 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 I'm I'm Okay. But deep down inside, you're crying. Deep down inside, you're not being honest. And the next step is we need to be honest with others. Church, in this family, we need to be honest with each other and say it's okay not to be okay. And we want this to be a church where we could say it's okay to not be okay because that is the beginning of an honest life. That's the beginning of this life that Jesus was talking about. Just to be honest be honest to God and be honest with others. You know, the second thing that I want you guys to write down if you're taking notes is this. When it comes to a relationship and when it comes to real relationships that we're fighting for, we can't hide from this, church. We can't hide from this. Because the reality is in our relationships, in any relationship we have within our families and our church family, we're either winning or we're losing. You know, for some of us, we hide from God because we just don't feel good enough. And it reminds me of the story of Adam and Eve. I mean, everybody knows the story, right? You know, Adam and Eve, they bite the fruit. And they bit the fruit because of pride, because they felt like what they wanted to know was more than what God was asking of them. And they wanted to know more than God. You know, how many times have we bitten that fruit? Where are like... I know what you're trying to tell me, God. I know I should forgive this person, but, but man, this fruit tastes so good that I'm not really going to do that right now. And I know I should talk to my son because he's going through something, but I, I, it's kind of awkward to do that. And, and you bite that fruit and we hide because what happened in scripture, it says Adam and Eve hid. They were in shame. And sometimes in our life when, when, when something happens, we're, we're, we're in shame. So, so in scripture it says, God asked a hiding Adam, where are you? 
And sometimes we, again, we read that verse and kind of skim through it. Yeah, where are you? But the reality is this, is that why would God, who's omnipresent, who's everywhere at one time, ask Adam, where are you? Of course he knows where he is, right? And this is what I believe. I believe that he was asking why this man was not in his presence. And it reminds me about... Um, you know, when me and, me and my wife, Christy, go out to dinner, uh, if it's a date night or something, and um, I make the dumbheaded move to, like, hear a lot of rings on my phone, and I go and I, yeah, I'm sorry, I check it sometimes. And then I get indulged with it, and I start texting, and she kind of just slaps me and says, where are you? <laughs> she knows where I am. She knows I'm right there, but my presence isn't there. My presence isn't there. And so maybe for some of us, we're there with our family. We're there every day with our family. We're there every day here at church. We're, we're, we're there every day with our brothers and sisters. We're there every day with our parents, students. We're there every day with, with our sons and daughters, but we're not present. We're not in tune with what they're going on, what's going on in and around them. And God is saying today, let's be present. See, there's a second question that God asked. And um, see, Adam answered when, when he said, where are you? He said, well, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And then God replied with this, who told you that? Who told you that? In other words, who are you listening to? Because today, the reason why there might be a mess in our relationships, it's because we're listening to the wrong thing. We're listening to the wrong person. We're listening to the wrong source. And it, and it, and it has you in a moment where you say, I'm not good enough for this. I'm not pretty enough, students. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't know enough. I failed too many times and I'm not qualified. And Jesus is saying today, who told you that? Because those aren't my words. Because... I am who you say I am. And Jesus says, you are chosen, not forsaken. You are the head and not the tail. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am the new creation no matter what my past says. If he is for me, then who could be against me? See, in order to stop hiding, we need to redirect the focus back to Jesus and stop listening to the lies in our head. Students, there are a lot of lies that are playing around in your head. I'm not smart enough. I'm, I'm just stupid. You're, you're carrying this label that, that maybe because of your past mistakes, you're going into a new year in school and you're carrying the same label that you carried last year because you say, well, I guess that's the way I am. No, that's the lie of the enemy. And what he's saying right now is saying, I'm telling you who you are and you are fearfully and wonderfully made and you have a purpose and you have a life of restoration. You have a life of abundance that I want to give you. And parents, the same for you. God, God has a life for you and your children. You might think it might be over, but it's not over until God says it's over. And so I was thinking about that. And I was thinking about sometimes how we hide and sometimes in my life how I, I hid. Um, and for some of us, I believe that if I'm being honest, if we're being real today, church, that we kind of walk in. The church, we walk into our relationships, we walk into, um, you know, the, the, the people that are most important to us with a sign like this. So you may or may not know, my wife, Christy, um, this is actually hers, she has a disability. Uh, it's a neurological disability where at any given time, she can have an attack that causes her to be paralyzed. And... This could last a few hours, it could last one hour or three hours. It could also go up to lasting several days. So it, it numbs her whole body, she can't walk, she loses her speech, um, she can't move, she can't even see sometimes, and um, it's a disability. None of that is, of course, her fault, it's just something that's happened. But one thing that I love about my wife is her tenacity to say, I can still do what I can do. See, because 
Because there's times where she'll have an attack in the morning and maybe it lasts for two hours and she's paralyzed. She can't move because it's like this rare neurological disorder that she has. Um, and she can be paralyzed for two hours. But if she's okay after that, she says, I'm going to pick up the kids from school. <laughs> maybe she wasn't able to take the kids, but I can pick up the kids. Um, and there's times where, you know, maybe three or four hours she might have been lying there. And then I, I told Chris, you know, just rest. And she goes, no, 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 I'm fine. I could make dinner tonight. And the reason why I share this story is that sometimes in our life, not physically so much, maybe physically, but more relationally, we walk around with one of these. And we say, oh, you know what, Alex, I'm hearing you, but you don't know my past. You don't know what I've gone through. You don't know what's happened to me. See, the reason why I wasn't able to ever tell my kid that I love him, that I love her, is because my dad never told me that. And because of that, I walk around with this. It's kind of a, a, a get-out-of-jail-free card in a way with this disability. You know, Alex, I hear what you're saying, but you don't know what's going on at school. You don't know my past. You don't know my past mistakes. You don't know what I did when nobody was watching. You don't know that. And, and, and I know and I hear you and I, want, and I want restoration and I want this life of abundance with my relationships with my dad and my mom. But, but you don't know what I've been through and you don't know what's happened and you, and you kind of walk with this sign in front of you. And church, let me be the first to tell you that I'm sorry that those things happen and those things shouldn't have happened. And that's not your fault. It's not. It's not your fault. But can I tell you something? If we walk around with, with this sign and not do anything at all, we won't walk in the life that Jesus has called us to walk in. We won't walk in the life that Jesus has called us to walk in. And what Jesus is saying is, I know that you're hurt, and I know everybody has their separate story. So it's not about judging or comparing what this person can do and what the other person can do. It's doing what you can do. It's doing what you can do. And that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying today, man, I have, I have a miracle and you're at the brink of a miracle. And all I need you to do is to do what you can do. And it may not be much. It may not be much. But if you give it, there's going to be a blessing in store. And the reason why sometimes we're like, oh, man, I just don't feel God or I don't feel his presence or I don't, you know, I, I pray and, and I don't understand why I, I don't, I don't may, maybe get, you know, the thing that I'm, I'm really desiring and asking for. You know, sometimes God has called us to wait, but sometimes God is waiting on us. And God is saying, I just want you to do what you can. Haven't you seen it in scripture? You know, when Jesus performed miracles, it was, it was when a person could only do what they could do to receive the miracle. And so um, how many of you like uh, Rocky movies? Raise your hand. All right, I love Rocky movies. There's a specific Rocky movie that I love because it has a, a really awesome scene about Rocky and his son. And Rocky is talking to his son and he's saying, man, I want you to have life. It's almost like how God is saying and speaking to us in a way and saying, I want you to have this life, but I need you to fight for it because I'm always going to love you. I'm always, no matter what, because we've got to remember that we're not fighting for his love and acceptance. We already have that, church. It's not an achieve to receive mentality. It's we've already received Christ. We've already received his goodness, his mercy. And because of that, because of his love and his mercy and the passion that is, in with, that, that is within me, because of that, I want to achieve for him. See, sometimes we've got to flip. We got to flip the mentality. And so this, this scene in Rocky kind of talks about, you know, a father to, to his son and, and to his child and saying, I want more for you, but you have to fight for it. I'm going to show you that clip right now, then we'll continue. Let's watch this. I start to get a little ahead. I start to get a little something for myself, and this happens. Now, I'm asking you as a favor. Not to go through with this, okay? This is only going to end up bad for you, and it's going to end up bad for me. You think I'm hurting you? Yeah, in a way you are. That's the last thing I ever wanted to do. I know that's not what you want to do, but that's just the way that it is. Don't you care what people think? Doesn't it bother you that, that people are making you out to be a joke and that I'm going to be included in that? Do you think that's right? Do you? You ain't gonna believe this. Well, you used to fit right here. I'd hold you up and say to your mother, 
This kid's going to be the best kid in the world. This kid's going to be somebody better than anybody ever knew. And you grew up good and wonderful. It was great just watching you. Every day was like a privilege. Then the time come for you to be your own man and take on the world, and you did. But somewhere along the line, you changed. You stopped being you. You let people stick a finger in your face and tell you you're no good. And when things got hard, you started looking for something to blame, like a big shadow. Let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is gonna hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, now go out and get what you're worth. But you got to be willing to take the hits and not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that, and that ain't you. You're better than that. I'm always going to love you no matter what. No matter what happens. You're my son. You're my blood. You're the best thing in my life. But until you start believing in yourself, you ain't gonna have a life. Man, that's, uh, that's a powerful word right there, right? I mean, it's almost like God is saying, I'm always gonna love you no matter what. You're always gonna be mine no matter what. But if we don't fight, for our relationships, for real relationships with our family, we're going to lose. We're going to miss out on this abundance that God wants for us in our families, with our children, students, with your parents. Jesus is saying today, do what you can do. Do what you can do. And there could be a miracle in store when we do what we can do. See, Jesus modeled this in John 6, 8 through 14, and I'm wrapping up here, um, but stay with me, guys. John chapter 6, verse 8 through 14, it says this. Then Andrew, Simon, Peter, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Have you ever said that, church? What good is that? What good is, is what, I, what, what I could only do? I only have this, God. I could only give this, God. This is all I can give right now. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Verse 10 says, Jesus said, tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered 5,000 people. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterwards, he did not... He, sorry, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers, because now there's leftovers after feeding 5,000, so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. When the people saw him, do this miraculous sign, they explain, surely he is a prophet we have been expecting. God is expecting to do a miracle in your life. And all he's asking for is your lunchbox. All he's asking for is for you to give what you can. And this is my son's lunchbox here. I'm going to make everybody hungry here. And, um, you know, right here, there's just, man, I just have some chips. I have a Capri Sun. Who loves Capri Sun's? Um, and, you know, there's just different things here. Um, PB&J, can't go wrong with PB&J. And this kid who just had a, just a little packed lunch gave what he could, and Jesus did a miracle. You know, today, I'm going to say it again, church, not tomorrow, not a year from now, but today, God wants to do a miracle for your family. And all he's asking for is for your lunch. All he's asking for is to do what you can, to take a step of faith. I know it's scary, church. I know it's, it's, it's not that common. But today, 
You might be about to cross the line of divorce. You might be about to give up on your parents, students. You might be about to ready to throw in the towel. But can I just tell you, don't give up and do what you can. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, it says, So let's not get tired of doing what's good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. See, the reason why I'm standing here today and, I, and I'm able to give you guys this word, I'm able to do this ministry thing, I'm able to have a family, um, I'm able to still be married. It's not because I got it all together because I don't. I've made so many mistakes in my life that go as deep as a sea. But the reason why I'm able to stand here and still be married and still have a closer relationship than what I used to have with my kids and with my wife is because I didn't give up. Because I didn't give up. And Jesus is saying the same thing to you. He's saying, don't give up. I know you're, on, you're, you're right on the brink of, of crossing this line, this broad path, this broad path where, where it leads to destruction. It leads to things that are not filled with rest restoration, but filled with doubt and fear and a fake life. But today Jesus is saying, don't give up. Don't give up, church. Don't give up on your family. Don't give up on your, on your husband. Don't give up on your wife. Don't give up on your brother. Students, don't give up on your parents. Church, don't give up on this church. The best is yet to come. If we believe it and if we don't give up. Restoration is found through Jesus. And I believe he wants to do some healing today, right now. So many times we kind of just wait for tomorrow and say, I say this to, this, to, to our students all the time, you wait to do things that God wants you to do tomorrow and tomorrow, I'll do it the next day and the next day. But if you wait for tomorrow, you'll never experience the promise that God has for you today. And today he has a promise for you. Today he has a miracle for you. And I know in, in your mind you might think, yeah, 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 that's for somebody else, but that's not for me. No, he's, tra he's talking directly to you. And so right now, church, I want to do something right now. You know, it's not that common, but can we stand? Because sometimes before we fight, we just need to stand, right? And with every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around as we stand. See, in just a moment, we're going to give you an opportunity to receive prayer for your families. I know it's hard, but church, it's time to be real. Be real about where we are right now. Because that's harder than this. What's harder than this, what's harder than, than maybe stepping out and fighting for a family is going back home to the fake home, to a life of regret, going back to pain. When Jesus is saying, I have healing for you today. I'm going to ask if the prayer team could come up and stand on the ends as we're going to have an opportunity to pray for you and your family. So as our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, nobody looking around. When I say amen, I'm going to pray for you guys. And when I say amen, sometimes we just need to take a step. It might be a fearful step. It might be a step that we haven't taken in years. It might be the first step that we ever taken for our families. But remember, Jesus just wants you to do what you can. And sometimes that's just giving your lunch right now. Maybe, it's, maybe you're fighting for your family that's not here today. Maybe you're fighting for your family that is here today. And you need to bring them up to the altar. And you need to just be prayed over. Or you parents, pray over your children. You students, grab your parents if your parents are here. And come down to the altar and pray with them. Jesus, I'm so glad you remind us that there is a way to life, a life full of forgiveness, full of restoration, full of honest and real relationships and a real family. Lord, if we're being honest right now, a lot of us are hurting. A lot of us don't know how it's all going to work, but Lord, we know that when we could come to you, we don't have to have it all figured out. 
We just need to be real with you so you can do a real work in us. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I believe that today is the day God wants to do a miracle in your family. Today is the day that we could stand up and tell the devil, it's over. You don't have any more power in this house, Satan. You don't have any more power in my life. Today is the day we fight for a real family. And it all begins with a single step of faith. God says, do what you can and I will perform a miracle with your lunch. And so in just a second, I want to invite all our families to the front to get prayed for your family. If you've never done this before, I know it's hard. But God is nudging you right now. Sometimes it takes an act of faith to activate the miracle that is waiting for us. And church, I want you to know this. If we can't stand up for our families here in church, when we celebrate that here, then when can we stand up? It's time we stand up and say no more excuses, no more waiting, no more lost time. Today is a day when things will change. And if that's you, then please bring your family to the altar right now. And have our prayer team pray over you. Father, we just ask for every person who is coming and for every fear that is maybe holding them back. And I pray, God, that you give them the faith to activate the blessing that's in store. That today we don't have to block the blessing that you want to give us today. But when we activate and take a first step and say, I'm going to bring my family here so we can say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So, Father, we ask for that. We ask for that strength and that courage for us to do that and for us to answer the nudge. So church, come down and get prayed for. Church, let me remind you that today your family doesn't have to be there for you to fight for them. You could take a stand for your family, even if it's just you.
Church family, God is doing a work. He's performing miracles. We're finding restoration in this church, in this family, within each other. We're breaking down pride. We're breaking down iniquities and insecurities. In Jesus' name, God is doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. And I've been born again into a family. Amen. Your blood flows through my veins. Let's sing that verse again. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. And I've been born again into a family. Your blood flows through my veins. And I'm no longer slave to fear. Why, church? Because I am a child of God. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. Why is that? Because I am a child of God. Sing it again. Come on. Yes, I'm no longer a slave believe it, that I am a child of God. Yes, I'm no longer a slave to fear, because I am a child of God. God, we're believing that today, that we are your children, that you haven't forgotten about us. And you reminded us today that you haven't forgotten about us and that you still have life for us, that it's not too late. The enemy has said it was too late, but it's not too late for our families. If we just take a step and do what we can, if we fight for a real life versus a fake life, if we stop hiding and start doing, God, we know that you have this life of abundance because we know that when we do what we can, which it may not be much. You perform miracles and you do the rest. So God, when we fight, we could also find rest in you. And in this moment, some of you got prayed over and you took that first step. And I can't wait to see the miracle that God has for you in your life. And that's ahead. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's believe that together. Come on. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for restoration, for opportunity, for the Holy Spirit to move in us and through us the way you have done today, God. Help us to be reminded that we don't have to go back the same way that we came in this morning and that we can have real change in every relationship, relationships within our blood family, relationships within our friendships and our coworkers and even our enemies and a, a real relationship with this church. So we thank you, God, for those type of relationships. We're choosing to walk the path of the narrow. We're choosing to walk the narrow path because we know when we do, there is life, a full life, full of faith, full of fun, full of grace that is waiting for us. So we thank you, Jesus. We thank you for who you are and what you're going to do in us and through us, through the step that we took today. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen, amen. Let's give it up for God this morning. Come on.